I'm very excited that the Rachak Review is hosting its first ever book review on video. And Be'ezu Hashem, we have the special zchus that we're going to speak to the author of this fascinating book. It's called Marian, Marian Bad and Beyond by Rabbi David Leitner. And this book is, it's a very interesting, the name of the book refers to a town, a spa town, in the Czech Republic, uh, where where people used to come, you know, for vacation and for therapeutic, um, for therapeutic remedies, and the Leitner family owned a hotel in this town, Marienbad, and that brought them into contact with many of the pre-war G'daylim of Chal Yisrael. So this book talks about the Leitner family and what they did with their hotel and the different people that they came into contact with. And then it goes beyond that and talks about the Leitner family's travels, you know, to Santiago, Chile, and then eventually they're settling in Manchester in England. And it talks about the the history of the Leitner family. So we, we have over here with us this evening, we have David Leitner, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the book. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll learn some very interesting factoids. But before we talk about the great story that this book tells us, I wanted to point out that one of the great draws of this book is the rare photographs and pictures and documents and postcards that are reproduced therein. Um, you can take a look and you'll see this. It's not just text. There's all kinds of interesting documents and things that, that appear in this book. So I was wondering, Rabbi David, if you could tell us, how did all of these pictures and documents survive the war? Like, where, where, where did people... Where did you find these documents? How do you compile all of this when you were writing the book? Well, for my 70th birthday, my son arranged that all my children and my wife will meet in Marienbad from all over the world, wherever they lived. Two lived in Etisol, one in Gateshead, some from Manchester, some from London. And we all met in Prague within half an hour of each other. And we took two minibuses up to Marienbad. And we had a an evening meal together and the next morning we had everything planned beforehand and the last visit we did there was visit the Marine Bad Museum. They knew we were coming and although normally on Monday they closed, uh, they opened up specially for us and they had everything prepared and when, before we left he gave us a USB stick with a lot of these photos on it which were recorded by somebody called Richard who was a historian of that period and I had permission to copy those photos into the book. My father had quite a few photos although he didn't have that much because he had to run away from the Nazis so it was a scrocky potties. I met one or two people uh, I was reading a, a safer on the Briskerov and the person stood next to me, he over, looking over my shoulder, and he said, oh, I know who wrote this book. He's, he might have some photos of Marienbad for you. So two weeks later, I was in Etisol for Hasna, and went straight from the airport to this person's house, and I bought quite a few photos from him um, that he had the rights for. So slowly, I put photos together from different places. It was all our scrocky potties. The whole book took me only a year to write and to put together. Uh, as I say, my father had to run away without just his clothes on his back, not much more. So he didn't take any documents with him. But he spoke a lot about it. So as your mom had Siata de Shmaya when, when you were writing this book to be able to find all of these pictures to, to make it the Mamash a, a, a Dover Muslim. Yeah. Uh, the pictures... Uh, uh, say a thousand words and therefore I was I found it important to put as many pictures as possible. I had more pictures but those that weren't good quality I decided to leave out because it takes the the quality of the book down. Makes sense. So, I, so, yeah. uh, so it, it's an interesting point that you know Marienbad is in is in the Czech in the area of Czech or Czechoslovakia and you know l usually people associate you know, uh, Czechoslovakia or Slovak, Slovak or Czech Jewry with the Hungarians, but in fact the Leitner family were actually Yekas. 
Right, like yes. the, the name Leitner right. is pronounced in, in in you know in the old in the German way of pronouncing, not Leitner but late but not late let light Leitner but Leitner, right? So Leitner, maybe yeah, we, Leitner, maybe, yeah. maybe you could tell us about how how it was to be a, a sort of Yekisha family living in Czechoslovakia. It was on the German border, so it was only about uh, twenty miles from Germany, and. You never know over the centuries how Jews had to travel. I mean, before they went to Marimba, they were about five miles further down the road in a town called Drumol. Well, there was a community there till 1938, which was destroyed by the Nazis. And all that's there now is a base of cross with very few much savings. Right, interesting. So, so the, the main character in the book is your father, I believe, right? And you call him Opa, which is... I guess German for father. No, for grandfather. For grandfather. Ah, yeah, me, me, your kids yeah. called called him grandfather. My father, we called Opa because that was his nickname in the family. In the family, and my, and most people called him Kurt or Chaim Arye. What what was how did how did they you know, refer to him in general? Most people in those that generation, um, especially before the war, the Yekers, they had. Goisha names, and because they went to Goisha schools, he was known as Kurt. Uh, of course, the Rebbe's called him by his Hebrew name, Chamaria, but it was uh, in the world he's known as Kurt. Kurt Leitner. Okay, and so w w one of one of one of the big things that you discussed in the book is you talk a lot about Agudas Yisrael in pre-war Europe. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about you know what was the function of Agudas Yisrael. In you know before the war, what, what were they what were they doing? You know nowadays we tend to think of a good Israel, at least in, in America we look at a good Israel as mainly like a lobbyist group that sort of petitions the government for different Jewish interests. And in Eretz Israel we tend to think of a good Israel as sort of a political party within the Knesset. But you know the pre-war a good Israel was actually quite anti-Zionist and had more of a sort of community role. Than, than more of a general, you know, political type of thing. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what they were doing and, and you know, how they brought together different communities and, and tried to be Mechazek Yiddishkeit. Well, at the beginning of the 19th, 20th century, uh, the, the Zionists and the Reform, and the Enlightenment, as they were called, the Abedinsky and the, and the Herzl, they had taken... Uh, Yiddishkeit and diluted it, and basically a lot of the Orthodox Jewry were falling by the wayside. And then the Chovetz Chaim, together with Briskerov, who established a, a chizuk for Klalisar. I mean, Samson Fall Hirsch himself had this problem in, in Germany, right, that all the, the from Jews were falling apart. I mean, there is a town in, in Czechoslovakia called Pilsen. Which has a, a a shul, a reform shul, which over two and a half thousand seats, and around the corner, there's the remnants of a, a Heimische shul, which basically is one room, right, which might have housed thirty people. Wow, right. So that's the contrast to where, and the, the Chovetz Chaim and the Briskerov, they set up this that the from Eden should form a a, a, a chizu between themselves and, and fight back, right? So they set up uh, Beis Yaakov. I mean, Beis Yaakov, in fact, something I don't mention in the book, but Beis Yaakov was set up by Sarah Shanira uh, on the advice of the of this, of the uh, Rebbe Sochadov from Bells, who he sent, she sent her brother to speak to the Bells of whether to go ahead with it or not, right? And he encouraged her to... to Go ahead, and that's you know yourself what came out of it. And by setting up that, and all the help that it came out of and by the yeshivas that helped even Kela Yishu, which was unofficially run by the Chazanish in Etisol, that helped the farmers settle down in, in Etisol, uh, because not everybody can sit and learn. So they, the setup even helped for people who were working to make ends meet, and that was basically to to help set up Hamish Hamish Yiddishkeit and not not 
basically to fight back from the, from the Zionists and the reform. And so it was an essential part. If it's not for the goodness he saw, I showed you to think what would have happened. Because when Herzl came up with the idea that we've got there to solve, we don't need anything else. And there was a strong movement, you know, the Eden had been in Gaulus mm -hmm. for so long, that all of a sudden they had the Balfour Declaration in 1917, and there was hope that we'll get Eti Sol back. And the Zionists, they said, once we've got Eti Sol, that's it, we don't need anything else. And therefore people started forgetting about Shabbos, about Talat and Mishpocha and everything else, and the, the God you saw had to fight back on that. In fact, uh, Zalman Zorotskin, who was the first chairman of the Chinuch Atzmoy in saw, he spoke of the Kenesir Gedeila, and he said quite emphatically that it's more important to have Jewish Chinuch than to have saw. We managed for 2,000 years without saw, but without Chinuch of our children. And that's why they put a lot of emphasis into 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 Beis Yaakov movement and, and, and the Chetorim and the yeshivas to, to fund them and to encourage them wherever they could. Yeah, in the hindsight of you know, in contemporary society, it's hard for us to imagine that people didn't realize that you know education is like the most important thing in, in Klai Yisrael, that the building yeshivas and building schools for, for the children. You know, there were tons of communities all over the world that didn't have Jewish communities all over that just didn't have that sort of infrastructure, and Cam nothing Cam came of them. Yeah, yeah. Cam Ejibinsky, although he didn't attend the Knesset because he wasn't well, he asked one of his Talmidim, uh, uh, Silver from Cincinnati, to come over to the Knesset, and he travelled all the way from America. In those days, by I had to come by boat. He came late. And he yeah, left yeah. early, right? Huh? And he left early also, right? He left early because he had to yeah. get back for Rosh Hashanah, right? Well, you mentioned that in but, the book, I remember. Right? And imagine today, what would America be like without a good as you saw? You know what Moshe Shera did and what uh, Mike Tress did to save people and to establish Yiddishkeit in, in, uh, in America. And that all came because... Chaim Oizer invited the Blazer Silver from Cincinnati to come to the Knesset. So, so let, let, let's talk about the Knesset and, and what was your family's role in arranging it and taking care of the logistics of the Knesset that happened, the third Knesset happened in the, in the town of Marianbad. So what, what, was, what was your family's involvement in it? There was a, a, a semi Knesset in 1936 where Rabbi Yaakov Rosenheim, with a few other Agudis um, workers, came to, to, to Marimbad on holiday, and they were discussing about having the necessity of having a, an, another Kinesia, and there was talk of having, having in Yishalayim even, because the Balfour Declaration had been, that it was sort of going to be given to the Eden, but they weren't sure whether they would be allowed to go there. <clears throat> and while he was in the town, Rabbi Jacob Rosenheim had contact with my father, who was a, a first-class born organizer. He was, he, he, everything, everything was very yekish, right? And he was a brilliant organizer. He thought of everything. And he, he appointed him to be the organizer of the... Because he lived in the town, he, ha, he had a hotel himself. His uncle had the hotel next door, right? And he had contacts with the with the local people. He was very uh, able to talk to people and diplomatic. And so he appointed him as a secretary for the Kinesia. He had about six months to prepare it, and but he had to get people from all over the world to you know invite people and make accommodation. Uh, have somewhere to have a program. All that had to be done. Now, the book tells about how they, they got special permission from the government to do shiputzim in the, in the town hall to, so that they can accommodate all the people that were going to gather together for the Knesset. And it talked about... Well, well, Mena Shemai, the deputy Lord Mayor of the town was called uh, Fritz Buxbaum, a, a Jewish man. He wasn't from, but he was Jewish. And he... Because the uh, Knesset was growing, all the delegates, everybody wanted to come, right? Um, the, the hall was too small. So they're going to move to Carlsbad, which is 20 miles down the road, to a bigger venue. And when 
Fritz Buxbaum heard that, he said, I'm not allowing that. We've got all the Jews coming to Marienbad. I want them here. Because don't forget... It's good for business. Already, it's good for business. Well, it's good for business. And at that time already, the, the, the uh, tourist business was coming down because of the uh, anti-Semitism and all the rest of it. So they were very eager to make the Kennesia as a big attraction for... In fact, it was the last big attraction in, in the town before the war. But in the, talked about, in the book you talked about how they got special rights from the government, that they could send out a mail for free and different things like that. Um, yeah, okay. a, a, another thing that you discussed in the book is your family's special relationship with the Baba Rebbe and the Belz Rebbe. So maybe you can uh, elaborate a little bit on, on those points. And what, what, what's the special yeah. shaykhus and some, maybe tell us some Rebbe, interesting stories if you have. The Baba Rebbe's connection came from the First World War. Because in, in the 1916, uh, he had to leave Galicia and he had nowhere to go. So he arrived in Marimbad in Ere Pesach and he stayed there for nearly six months, free of charge. And my father, my, my late father, Rav Shalom, was a, a school friend with Rav Shlomo Halberstam, the previous Bob Rebbe. They were the same age, and they used to play together. So that, that's, that's where their connection with Bob came. And in fact, many of the Bob and the Gunim were <coughs> inspired in Marimbad on, on, the, on Friday night Tish, that the Rebbe gave Tish there. So what's your favorite Bob of Huh? What's your, how, which one? How does it go? We sing every Friday night. Yeah. How does it go? How does it go? I'm not very musical myself, but uh, I hear. Okay, and 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 the shaykhs to the with the Belzareba is is even even more of a connection. The the Belzareba was very instrumental in determining the fate of the Leitner family and what happened to them in the war and where they ended up living. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the, the first connection was uh, with Rabbi, Rabbi Socher Dov, who used to come every year for about eight weeks to Marimbad. It wasn't so much that he needed the holiday, but because Marimbad hosted a lot of affluent Jews and <clears throat> they mixed with the Rebbe, people came for brochures or for advice and things like that, and they, they, they financially was worth his while to come, and he also had influence on the wider public. A lot of the uh, Zionist people came to Marimbad as well. Wasn't, uh, and he had an influence on those people as well. But at the time, um, during the first war, before the First World War, my grandfather had built an extension, a large extension to the hotel, and that needed funding from the bank. And during the First World War, there was very few visitors who could afford to hotel expenses, and they couldn't afford to, re to pay the mortgage. So the bank wanted to put the hotel on auction to try and get the money back. And the Gabba came down Moti Shabbos to f get some food to take to the Rebbe to eat in his uh, upstairs in his room from Mamalka, and he saw that my grandfather was very upset because he'd received a letter from the bank that the uh, the last final demand note for a large amount of money to repay the bank. And so they asked him why is he upset and he told him that uh, things aren't good. So he took them to the Rebbe and he said, why should I come to the Rebbe? Has the Rebbe got money to lend me? Because he was a like a real Yekisha, a real Yekisha. A real Yekisha. He didn't, he didn't understand that the Rebbe came with eight, he took 18 bedrooms at the time, so he was a good customer. A third of the hotel were right. taken up by the Gaboim and the Rebbe and his, his family and all the rest of it. So, as of my father, he was a good customer, but Mitzad uh, Rebish Kite, he had no connection with him. Um, so, they took him up to the Rebbe and wrote a crittle, and they read the crittle, and he, the Rebbe said, You remain by the boss. And he said, Madeltov, and that was it. And that was on Moti Shabbos. On Sunday morning, one of the affluent visitors at the hotel asked my grandfather for, to do me a favor, that he had to travel back to Prague, and he had another meeting 
had to catch another train from Prague onwards. And he would like officially to go home to pick up his post. But he didn't want to chance it in case he misses the connecting train. So if my grandfather could do him a favour and send one of his children with on the train, he'll pay all the expenses. And my father travelled with him to Prague. And then he went to his house, picked up the post and came back to the station. He was still there, so he managed to give him the post. But then he inquired at the station when was the next train back. And the next train back on that Monday morning was, I think, seven hours later. It was only a small village. We only had two direct trains a day. So my father said, what should I do for seven hours now? So he went, unofficially, he went to the bank to try and speak to the bank manager. He didn't have an appointment, but he told me he happened to be in Prague for other reasons, and he wants to try and negotiate with the bank manager. Uh, of course, the bank manager said it's too late. We've already issued the... The bank has also got a protocol how to deal with bank debts. Um, so my father tried to negotiate. He said, listen, the massive, you won't get a buyer that will cover the debt because nobody's got money at the moment. You, you know, you're buying, you're buying a, an empty shell. There's no customers at the moment. So what's the point of selling it? Uh, he gave me his word that as soon as things pick up, you were the first one to pay up. And the auctioneer for the hotel was already in Marimbad, across the road in the Hotel Excelsior, to put the hotel on auction. So he said, you know what? Ask the auctioneer to phone me when you get back. And Kach Haver, and they postponed the uh, auction. And in the meantime, things picked up and they managed to repay everything. Before the Second World War, all the loans were repaid. Oh, so the Rebbe made a mythos. That was the Rebbe, uh, that was the first contact with the soccer dog. Now, Sokhodov died in, uh, he was nifted in 1926, and his uh, son, Alan, took over, and he was completely different. Alan never left the hotel room, basically. He was, he was there for six, eight weeks. And the boy mixed up, when people came to him, but he never left the room. He was more secluded, he was more uh, himmelmensch, as they call him. Right? His brother was more the, the ambassador to the world, no? Yeah, 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 he was... Uh, yeah, but he, he was very, uh, he was known as a holy man. I mean, the first time I went to Marimba was in 1992, and the Lord Mayor of Marimba was a goy. He still had a picture of Aaron hanging in his office, believe it or not. He's called him the Wonder Rabbi. Wow. He, they had a lot of respect for him, right? And uh, during the, before the war, my father was in bells, in stately bells over Sukkot, and the Baron told him that if you leave, you should all leave together, right? And, and they made sure to give him silverware. We mentioned huh? that this. You mentioned in the book that they made sure to give him silverware when he was when he was there. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> in Marimbad, the Rebbe you see with his fingers, like the Rebbe's do, and my grandfather couldn't understand. Men of Yisain be a dam, huh? Men of Yisain be a daini. Yeah, it hasn't changed. I mean, today I was in Etisar in 1967 with with my father, Elvis Shalom. I went to visit the present Belzer Rebbe. He just got married. He was only 19 at the time, and uh, living still in Agripas in the old old yeshiva, near the old yeshiva, and rang his bell at his table, and the gabba came in, and he Rebbe motioned something with his fingers and the rabbi understood bringing some fruit so he brought a bowl of fruit and the gabba went out the minute the gabba went out the rabbi rang again he says for a yekka you need a plate and knife and fork right you can't just have a fruit without it so they, they, they follow the examples of their grandfathers So how, how did the Belzer Rebbe tell your father you know, where to go and what to do in the war? You know, he was in a very interesting predicament when World War II broke out because he was engaged to his Kala and his Kala ended up running away to Chile. So what, what did the Belzer Rebbe tell him to do and, and what, what happened over there? My father, although he was a Yekka, he, he, he wouldn't do anything without consulting with Bells. And in the book, we've got 12 letters of correspondence between my father and the Belzer Rebbe, right? 
which are unique for the book. It's the first time they've been released to the public. And one of the things the Rebbe objected was Chile had a, a name of um, an immoral country, right? And he was very loath to let him go to Chile. Now, what changed was that my father had a good friend, um, Slimer Baumgarten from London, and he asked him for advice. And well, Slimer Baumgarten had a brother-in-law who also escaped to Chile. He was a, a very from, he was a Satma Chosid, a very from Yid, Avon Tauber. And he wrote to him an anonymous letter without even signing it. Right? Just spoke to him as my brother-in-law and he asked, he made inquiries about the matzah in Chile. In a roundabout way, without mentioning the words, he wanted to know, first of all, how my mother's family had settled for the past eight years. Are they still Jewish? Are they assimilated? Or do they still keep everything? And secondly, he wanted to know whether there's any facilities like a mikveh. To get married, you've got to have a mikveh, right? So he wrote back to his brother-in-law, in the affirmative that the, the Kokish family haven't changed one iota and there's a, a mikveh there, kosher mikveh, which his wife also uses and it's, everything's okay, right? So, Roslema Wongarten contacted Alan the Bells and informed him of this is the matter, he's got, he's got no choice, my, my mother couldn't come out, right? The British government wouldn't allow her in after the war. Uh, to come to England because they weren't married yet so there was no excuse for her to come if she would have been married it would have allowed her for humanitarian reasons to come to England so my father had to go there and so eventually the, 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 the Baron wrote him a letter that he allows him to go uh, but don't become a, a don't become a toy shop go get married and that's uh, so how long did your father end up in, in Chile Sakakal? He, he arrived in 1946, on 1946, and he left in 1955. Nine, nine years he was there. Now, there's a whole story over there when he w- w- that he established a, a matzah ba- a, a, a matzo, matzo yeah. baking factory, and then he was going to transfer it to England, and then Lamaisa didn't work out. You, Lamaisa, you were you were born and you mostly grew up in in Chile. Well, I was seven when I left. You, were seven. Yeah. you, you have any memories of of? of Chile or that you were too young? Well, I remember my mother's mother, I remember her, um, she was an Amonoth from 1930 with four daughters and they all escaped to Chile in 1938, 39. After Kristallnacht, a week after Kristallnacht, they, they got out of Austria and they got a permit, a visa to go to Chile. Now in Chile, they actually lived in a Goetia family they got one room in a Goetia house and there they had to make Pesach and everything else but they kept everything now well, I was born in 1948 and I remember my grandmother although she was an Almona uh, she kept all the Minhogim that she saw from home right she was a light enough Gebrox or Nist Gebrox? huh? Gebrox or Nist Gebrox? yeah on Pesach? We had Gebrox. Yeah, I know, but he, I remember my grandmother on Little Nacht, on the 25th of December, when the Minig is in the, in the Eden, they don't learn. Oh, you have to play right? cards, yeah, Vada. Right, but my grandmother hasn't got the halacha because she doesn't learn anyway. She hasn't got a, a, a mitzvah Talmud Torah, but she saw her father on Little Nacht didn't learn. So I still remember my grandmother, she sat there with a big pile of newspapers and made... <laughs> Cut them up into toy- oh, yeah. tablets. Oh yeah, by ready paper, and she cut up newspaper. That was her, her job on Little Nacht, right? The shame. Very nice. Um, okay, so so ha- tell us maybe what made your father decide to leave Chile and move to go back to England to go to Manchester after the war. It was a big turmoil all over the world. Nothing was established, not in America, not in Etisau, and not in England. There was everything was suffering from re, from from the, from the war. 
<coughs> so there was a debate where to go. The reason why he left was one reason only, and that was Chinuch. There was a big Jewish school in Chile with 400 children, only Jewish children, but that the Leitner boys, the three Leitner boys who went to school, were the only ones with tzitzis and kapels. We learned nothing about Shabbos, nothing about Yom Kippur, nothing at all about Purim. There was no Jewish education in the Jewish school apart from Eretz Yisrael or Israel, right? Bealik and Herzl, that's all we learned. And every morning we used to host the flag on a flagpole and sing Hatikva, right? That's the only English guy we had from school. So my father, on Shabbos morning, we used to, for good weather like I saw, he used to go for a walk and he used to tell us the, the, the stories of the Chumash and Yosef and, 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 the, and the others and the, and the stories of Marimbad, Epis, Yiddishkeit, right? And there was no future. You know, you can keep a child five, six at home, but once he gets by mitzvah age, he wants to play out with friends and we had no friends. So for that reason alone, they decided to leave. And the Stroker Protes was that we arrived in England in the 16th of December 1955 and a week later, Pircha Goiz Yisrael made a Pircha Museum in Manchester. And the only reason why we went was because my cousin from London, which we never met before, he was saying the Hadron. He was chosen to say the Hadron. So... We had an excuse to go there. We weren't. We didn't learn Mishnayis. We weren't invited. We had a reason to go in. So my father, with three of, three of the boys, went along. My father, <laughs> there, in, in those days, the Balabatim sat on benches, the school benches. It was in a school hall with 200 people there all together. And the Balabatim sat on benches. So he had no seat. So somebody who recognized him from the Kinesia, a Mr. Falk, recognizing from the Kinesia, he, he pushed up a few people on the bench and made room for him to sit down. And for the three boys, we had to sit on the windowsill. Right? <laughs> yeah. And we got nothing. We didn't understand a word of English. But what we got out of that seeing, that we weren't the only boys to wear capels and wear titties. There were 200 boys. All of a sudden, we felt we are part of something bigger. Right? So within a week of having left Chile, we felt at home. Without saying a word, without understanding a word of the Sium, we came home that we are part and parcel of a bigger organization. And that developed, you know, we went to Pichim, Shabbos groups and camp and Sium and everything else, and we were very involved in that good So you, you, there were... In 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 when you when your father came, when your family came to Manchester, there were different sort of factions in the Manchester community, sort of machlekes that were warring with each other, and the way you describe it, your father was a sort of ish shalom that tried to bring different parts of the community together. He started a catering service and he had multiple hechsherim because he wanted to make sure that you know th these people would hold by it and these people would hold by it, and he didn't want to take any sides sort of in the machlekes. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what was going on and what was some of the politics that was happening and how your father was trying to sort of hold it all together. Well, Dan Abramsky, when he was dying in London, uh, he had the same problem that the, the, the ignorance of the butchers and the shochtim was such that as long as he had the modern David on the parcel, it was kosher, right? Um, <laughs> No, it was, the, the establishment was somehow they drifted. There was no, and we came to England with the same problem with the Besdin, right? The the cashers wasn't up to standard that the from Eden would, and so the former Sigadas start, started forming a, their own clique, so to speak, and they had to fight for to get Shrita in the, in the in the country. You had to have permission from the chief rabbi. And of course they wouldn't give it because they had already given it to the Besdin. And so there was a whole, basically a fight for many years until they managed to get Shrita of their own because uh, the president of Masikadas was somebody called Yossel Halpen who uh, my father used to describe as a very clever man 
But one thing he doesn't know, he said. He didn't know the word no. He didn't know what the meaning no is. Whenever he got no, he was such an action. He was determined, right? He didn't take no for an answer. And when he got no, and not a no from the chief rabbi, he can't shech, he negotiated with the chief rabbi of Ireland, at the time was chief rabbi Yakovovich, and they went to Ireland every Monday morning to shech. The shech used to take the Harper 7 KLM plight from Manchester to Dublin, and he used to shech there, and then bring the meat back over by boat overnight. And that's how it started, by determination. And now the wheels are more or less the other way around now. My Secret Asset is a big organisation and caters for the whole town. Yeah. So have you, have you mentioned before that you went back to Marine Bad, you know, as a, to, to visit in more recent times. Have you been back to Chile since you left? No, none, none of us have gone back. None of us have gone back. My brother, my older brother, was going to go back uh, in the early 1990s and then the in infidata started and his love told him not to go back. He's a family man, uh, it's expensive, just to go to see some quarry of the grandmother. It's very nice, but uh, it's not because I take the risk. There were hijacks and all the rest of it at the time, so he didn't go back. But he negotiated with the love there and he sent in photos of the of the grandmothers and his aunties following they were well well uh, looked after and uh, because of that he raised funds for the santiago mikra which is another story of ashkocha potis which is illustrated in the book yeah i mean Baksha, all the, most of the stories and most of the things that we spoke about in our interview you know are mentioned in this book. It's a very interesting book. In this book, again, it has these very interesting pictures of all the different G'daylam that, that visited the hotel and a lot of other anecdotes and very interesting things that we hadn't had a time to discuss. Um, Rabbi Leitner also wrote another book. It was published by Feldheim. Uh, called Understanding the Aleph Bays. So as a person who wrote a Sefer on Lashon HaKadosh, I could also appreciate this book. This is, talks about the Isis of Lashon HaKadosh, and it gives you all kinds of interesting Kabbalistic insights, gematria type things, and the meaning of letters, and big letters, and small letters, and all kinds of different things related to Lashon HaKadosh, and how the deep structures of the Hebrew language. This is also a very interesting book. And it's been a great pleasure to have you um, in, with this interview, Rabbi David. Any final words before we say goodbye? Yeah, the Aleph Bay's book came because of Chile. We went to a Jewish school. We learned how to read. But when I came to England, I was already seven and a half, and went to school. And we learned Chumash, Mishnayis, Gemara, whatever. But I went to Yeshiva, and I joined Dafa Yomi, I'd gone th three times to Dafa Yomi, and I didn't know what a Patach, a Komets, a Chirik, I didn't know what it was. But I never learned it in Cheda. I never went to school to learn Aleph Beis. I learned Hebrew, right? So I You learned learn about Patach and, Patach and Kamats. Yeah, I, no, I didn't know what it was. It just Cause, taught me how to read. Because there's no difference between a Patach and a Kamats. In, in modern Hebrew, they go, ah, and they go, ah, so it's no difference. Yeah, but I never learned it as a child, wow. so I had to start learning Alavet as an adult, and that's what the book came from. Because I started when I was fifty, basically, to learn Alavet, what everything means, and it's got a different meaning. Uh, the, that's the, how it came about. So it's a know, fascinating it's, book. So these these are Rabbi Leitner's two books, and we're the Rachak Review is 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 very happy to have discussed them with you and. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna call it we're gonna call it a day out here, okay? Call Thank to you very much. have a have Call a good night. Yeah. Thank you.